Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dark down for a I'm Jackie Cation, and you're listening to The Dork Forest. Uh, you know the website's JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com. The credits, Mike Rickberg sang that song. He wrote and composed it. He sang it with Sarah Cohen. He's going to sing again at the end, Mexican Hat Dance. And then Vilmos fixes the website, and Patrick Brady is going to fix this audio. JackieCation.com has my stand-up and live Dork Forest uh, schedules, including my upcoming Portland, Oregon. Uh, going to be doing Portland, Oregon live Dork Forest with Carrie Brownstein from Portlandia and a stand-up show July 13th. Feel free to come out to that. So the, the links are all on JackieCation.com. And there's a donation button on JackieCation.com and on DorkForest.com, which now points to all things comedy, which is the Umbrella Podcast host that I am with right now. That is amazing. All Things Comedy, by the way, has about 30 other podcasts that you can listen to. Feel free to cherry pick over there. They're on the right-hand side. The donation button on dorkforest.com and jackiecation.com are live. Feel free to donate. Knock yourselves out. I recommend everyone give me $100 a year. Yep. And if you don't have $100 a year, don't worry about it. Uh, just tell everybody that you love the show. And you can get merch if you want. That's another way to donate uh, and, and get stuff. You can get a Ranger of the Dork Forest t-shirt from JackieCation.com or uh, the Brett Chambers Dork Forest t-shirt. My CDs, you can buy those. You can also use the banner on the Amazon banner and buy your stuff through Amazon. And Amazon gives me a kickback. Last month, I made $39. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pretty sweet. Anyway, let's get into it. It's a good episode. Thanks for listening, folks. Hi, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. Sitting with me, a guy I have known, uh, I think, 10 years now. Lee Bennett, welcome to the program. Probably every bit of 10 years. Hi, Jackie. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. You are uh, one of Andy Ashcraft's best friends uh, since the dawn of man. You pretty were much. His, his best man. Since, since about uh, 1996, actually, Wow. when we met uh, for the first time in a uh, live-action role-playing game, in a LARP. I'd never met him before. I walked in. Yep. He was, uh, I think, my cousin in one of the LARPs and ended up being a flunky of mine for the game. <laughs> and that's how we met. Which LARP was it? Uh, it was uh, Oscar 1. Oscar 1. Yeah. And what is the... Ba based on the Oscars. Um, it's Oscar 1 because there was a second one that was Oscar 2. Oh, okay. Based on the Oscars? Yeah. That's it... what I love about LARPing. It can be about anything. Yeah. So, you know, Carrie, I was... Uh, a mogul who was a producer, Uncle Luigi. Uncle Luigi, <laughs> Luigi Napoli. All right. And um, uh, it's the first LARP I'd ever played in, actually. Okay. But got yanked into that. Didn't know, didn't know, but like two people in the game. Was it from Enigma? Yeah, it was it an was... Enigma LARP. Okay. I just found Enigma like two weeks before. Okay, because you were going to UCLA for master's? I was a postdoc. P postdoc. A postdoctoral research position there. There we go. Right, because you work at Caltech for JPL. For science, yeah, I work at Cal. I work with J. You know, it's at Caltech for an organization called the IPAC Infrared Processing Analysis Center, right? Um, and I'm an engineer and a manager there. We work with JPL, um, running space-based telescopes. telescopes, and we do uh, archiving for a lot of ground-based telescopes as well. Yeah, science, space, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and so what I tell people is like, it's the Hubble. Except for that it isn't the Hubble. No, it's, 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 not 19, the Hubble. it's like 19 telescopes later from yeah. the Hubble. It's like the Spitzer. Spitzer Space Telescope. Okay. Yeah. It is that one? Okay. Yeah. Hubble was uh, one of NASA's great observatories that's based on the East Coast. And oh, we're, we're, an we're, sort of, we're sort of the redheaded stepchild of that. You know, <laughs> we're, the, we're the last of the great observatories, the Spitzer Space Telescope. Excellent. See? It's still cool. You showed me around the last time I was, I was in Pasadena, South Pass, or wherever the hell we were. Pasadena, and, home right, campus. It was, uh, it was a room full of, uh, full of computers. Yep. And uh, there was some backing up going on <laughs> as, as, we, as I took the tour. <laughs> So, but here's now the reason I asked you to be on the show because there are many things you could dork out about. So many things. Clearly, clearly, you are a Renaissance dork. There's a you are a multifaceted <laughs> diamond of dorkdom. You could talk costumes. You could talk sword fighting. You could talk oh anything. D and we play D and D together. I could talk NASA and JPL. Clearly, you could, clearly, you could talk NASA and JPL. And uh, but you uh, you were my first introduction because because that's the first D and D game that we are still playing. Lo, these many years later, mm -hmm. Eberron. 
three point five. Uh, and as you were the one who said, Jack, you won't really be in when you until you can tell at a glance the difference between a D twelve and a D twenty, which the journey still continues. So, uh, but okay. So I've been getting some complaints lately, not complaints, but people saying not enough. DC talk, comic book wise, only Marvel because I only know Marvel and indie stuff, right? Mm. And the only DC titles I read are Batwoman and um, Animal Man, and then like a Dial H for Hero. That's a DC title. Yep. And then a couple of weird one-offs, but not not anything like Batman or Superman. You, I know, know plenty about Marvel, but let's talk DC today. Okay. Today, right? Okay. We're talking DC comics. We're talking DC comics. Uh, what do you know about them? Uh, well, they've been around for some time. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I've been reading DC Comics since I was probably five, which would have been eh, 1970, 71. All right. And I... so the, they were the first comics I started reading. Okay. And I think a lot of that was because, uh, you know, at the time, the George Reeves Superman TV show from, the I guess, the 50s was in syndication. Right. So reruns. And, yeah. And the Batman uh, TV show, the uh, Adam West, Burt Ward Batman, oh, was right. in reruns. So as a kid, I saw those characters on TV. Right. You know, when your dad takes you to the to the newsstand and he's going to buy you like two comic books, <laughs> right. you get the ones with the characters you know. And right. so I started meet, reading mostly DC. Got into Marvel years later when I was in high school. Okay. So Batman and Superman from the get-go. And both of those, I, see, I, I watched those Superman. And, oh, you know what happens? Is my, the damn phone goes off. I turned mine off. I, well, you are a better person than I am. I do telecons. <laughs> but you know who it was? It was my brother, Russ, who loves to call me and tell me what he's watching on television. Mm. So let's talk about television. <laughs> Is I saw those Batman and Spider-Man. Uh, Superman. Bat Superman TV shows. And I loved them, too, from yeah. when I was a kid. And what? Um, and, and were those early comic books cheerful? Were they? Well, I mean... It depends. It goes in waves. I mean, if you look at the the earliest DC or the earliest comic books, you know, 1938, 1939, um, the beginnings of Superman and Batman, especially Batman, you know, early on was was pretty dark. I mean, he was the Dark Knight detective. Uh, oh, okay. You know, it's set in 1939, 1940. You know, pulp noir was a huge thing. Right. Uh, World War II was going on. The Great Depression had just come out of. Right. You know, these these, these weren't the brightest comics right. in the world. Right. It was only sort of in the 50s um, after the um, McCarthyism and the, the, the Wortham trials uh, – where comic books were sort of put on trial, mostly because oh, right, of right. EC, okay. um, which had lots What's of EC? horror and, you know, e e I forget exactly what was it stands for. It was a brand of comics. Oh, okay. But they had oh, a lot okay. of trials um, about the, you know, because they had horror comics that were really graphic. Um, great comics, you know, the artwork in them is fantastic, but right. it's really dark. And so they had a lot of trials and they put in the comic book code, comic book authority code. Which you know established you know rules oh, sort of like the Hayes that you code had to follow. Movies. Exactly, okay. same thing. And um, the comic books that ma maintained the comic books that managed to jump, which was pretty much only DC, mm -hmm. um, they went you know almost childlike. Okay. And so the Batman the Batman TV show reflects the Batman comics of a few years before it. Okay. In the late sixties, mostly in response to Marvel. Um, DC started getting darker again, especially as Denny O'Neill, who was a great writer, is a great writer. Still um, around, that guy? Yeah, started writing uh, mostly detective in that time period, which was Batman. Detective, okay. detective comics. Uh, the, the, um, What's his name? DC? D Denny O'Neill. Denny O'Neill. And he wrote, did he write early Batman? And yeah, then he started... wrote Batman and then um, one of the real transformative ca uh, comic books of that time period, the Green Lantern Green Arrow series. Which is where they had Green Arrow's sidekick, Speedy, get okay. involved with drugs, which was a huge first for the comic books at the time. In fact, what year DC, was that? Um, late 60s? Yeah, 68, 69, maybe even as late as 70 or 71. I don't remember exactly. Okay. But one of the big issue deals about that one is they put it out without a comic book code authority stamp on it, which <laughs> was the first in probably two decades. Okay. Um, because it had Speedy taking drugs. It showed him shooting heroin right there on the cover. Wow. Yeah, which was, was a big a deal. this was a Green Arrow. Um, green Arrow, Green Lantern. And it was the first sort of, um, because I literally, Lee, I got an email today uh, because uh, somebody listened to a guy named, um, 
uh, I, I have space his name. Anyway, he listened to the Eric Martin episode. Uh, Eric Martin is rereading all of the Spider-Mans. Mm-hmm. And the guy that emailed me today was talking about how Sp- there was a Spider-Man arc in the early 70s that had one of Spider-Man's friends die of a drug overdose. Yeah. And he thought that that was the first one. It and may have been. It was pretty close. I, I'm not going to remember which one is first. They might have just been comparable, first. yeah. Yeah. You know, it was New York at the time. There was a lot of stuff going on. Right, right. In the late 60s, a lot of yeah. people were doing drugs and some people were dying. Jimi Hendrix, dead. Mm. Mm. Janice. Yep. Uh, so, but so Green, so he wrote Denny O'Neill. That's interesting because I only know, like, from, that's the Silver Age? Uh, that one is sort of the tail end of the Silver Age. If you really want to look at when the Silver Age began, you go back to um, the first appearance of the Silver Age Flash, which was showcase number four in like 1956. Okay. And so... Um, that was the beginning of it? or the- Yeah, that was the beginning of the Silver Age, because the Golden Age you know, starts in 1938 when you introduce Superman. Okay. And then a few months later when Marvel Comics number one shows up, which was Timely was the company that put it out at the time, not right. Marvel. But that had first Captain America, first Submariner, first Human Torch. Really? And then, you know, a few months after that, you had Detective 27, which is first Batman. Okay. So that's sort of the beginning of the Golden Age. That's because those were the first superhero comics. And then the Golden Age is considered to exist, and a lot of comics died off during that period. And then in the 50s, like I say, in 1956, they reintroduced new versions of the DC characters. Okay. So starting, you know, Superman and Batman has sort of continued. And then they started with a new version of The Flash, Barry uh, Allen, as right. opposed to um, uh, Jay. Um, oh, man, that's pretty bad. I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> no I worries. should know that. <laughs> and then the new version of Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, okay. as opposed to Alan Scott, him I remember. Okay. That's because you're a big Green Lantern guy, yeah. right? And Yeah. So they reintroduced new versions of these characters. And so that was what they called the Silver Age because, you know, being distinct from the Golden Age, but it was new versions of the characters. And, of course, years later, that leads to all the characters that are the Silver Age or the Earth One, quote unquote, characters. Okay. And then all the Golden Age versions of the characters are um, considered Earth Two, and you used to have Earth One, Earth Two crossovers, and Earth through One Justice and, League and all that kind of stuff. And those are parallel universes in the DC universe. Yeah, that's right? the way DC. That's the way DC. When DC decided to bring back some of the old characters and have crossovers, that there were um, parallel universes. Yeah, there that were they parallel came from. universes. Okay, and it was the Flash running on his cosmic treadmill, right? That uh, we could vibrate into the other universe, and that's what started it. I think they actually started it in Flash because they wanted to. Bring back the Golden Age Flash. Oh, okay. Which was Jay Garrick, by the way. I remember oh, there that we go. now. There, that's it. All you got to do yeah. is talk yourself through it. Exactly. And uh, yeah, that's been a thing because Earth 1 and Earth 2. I thought Earth 2 was created in the 80s for some reason. Are there only two Earths? Well, no. I mean, Now there's infinite Earths. Well, or no, there are right? there just 52. Oh, there are 52 there, there, Earths? There used to be you know, lots of them because you had you know, Earth 1, Earth 2, and then they had another one, which I'm not going to remember the name of, which had the... Um, uh, Injustice Society on it, you know, sort of evil versions oh, of the, the characters. Excellent. And then they had one which was the Captain Marvel or Shazam characters. Oh, yeah. Um, and then a few others here and there, which they used for bits and pieces. Okay. And then um, uh, then you had Crisis on Infinite Earths, written by Marv Wolfman, great series. Okay. Um, where they collapsed the DC Universe to one universe. And so the Golden Age versions of the characters and the Silver Age versions of the characters existed on the same Earth. Okay. Just in different time periods. This was a, this was a marketing ploy, if I remember correctly. Somebody. Um, I don't know if it was a marketing ploy as much as it was somebody ha- had a, an idea for a great story that would allow that needed- them to, to sort of merge it and tell versions of the stories with both characters. I don't know what, okay. what way it was or the other. Maybe they decided they didn't want to be writing all these multiple right. Earth things. Who knows? It, it kind of simplifies it, right? Because if you can just yeah. have one Earth. Because yeah. in Marvel, there's the ultimate, the Ultimates, yeah. right? Which is a parallel universe of some sort, right? I don't know in Marvel if they call it actually a parallel universe because in DC, they called them parallel because they crossed over and they interacted. Okay. You know, in Marvel's, the Ultimate Universe do, you know, Never. doesn't really interact with the other one. Okay. So there, you know, there have been parallel universes in Marvel. They've, they did that in Fantastic Four back in the 70s. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's, <laughs> there are definitely. Yeah. But yeah. So, uh, but I like the idea of there being one. I mean, if you're going to have like that, ult- I don't read any of the Ultimates titles, though I understand that they're excellent. I, my plate is full. 
of comic books. <laughs> uh, I can't. My <laughs> plate's for overflowing. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'm backed up, as as are you often, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, most of the time. You know, like a lot of the DC comics now, sometimes I'm fo- I run three, four months behind. I'll get on a jag. I'll read three or four months of uh, a books or a set of books, and then I'll catch up. I don't and, read as many as I'd like. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. busy. Everybody's busy, and, they're, and, and a lot of them have these crossovers, yeah. right? The, so... Yeah, DC was really doing that for a while because, you know, like say, you had Crisis that collapsed it to one Earth. Right. And then that went on for a while. And then they realized that there were characters that that caused problem with, like how do you deal with the Legion of Superheroes? Right. You know, because when they collapsed it, there was no Superboy. Superman was, you know, he was Clark Kent. Right. He grew up, went to college, went off, learned to become Superman, became right. Superman. <laughs> yep. Never a Superboy. But if you look at the Legion of Superheroes, which more or less continued intact through crisis, there was a Superboy in Legion. Huh. And so you, how do you explain that? And so they had like uh, another crossover. I think that one was Zero Hour, where they transformed the Legion. And they, they had a couple of three of these where they kept cleaning up their problems okay. that they created over the years when you know, fans, you know, people, people like you and me would go, Wait a minute. That doesn't, that make it... doesn't work anymore. Right. Well, what, now where did Superboy come from? Okay, in the Legion, you know, well, you know, in the original, uh, you know, Silver Age transitioning into the '80s or whatever. Okay, you know, Clark Kent um, actually put on a put on the costume as a as a teenager and was Superboy. Oh, before he turned into Superman. Before he grew up and became okay. Superman, and so the Legion comes back from the uh, the future and you know inducts Superboy because he was the first teenage superhero. Okay, into the Legion of Superheroes. Right. Um. But then, you know, like say, after Crisis, there mm-hmm. was no Superboy anymore. So, you know, how did the Legion know about a Superboy? Okay. Now, now here's where we have to... Um, there is the Justice League of America, yep. the Justice Society yes. of America, and the Legion yes. of Superheroes. Please define each okay. of those for Justice me. Justice Society was, you know, was the, the Golden first. Age. Oh, oh that's yeah, the Golden that's Age. That's the Golden Age. And so that was actually a Golden Age comic, Justice Society. was. They started in all-star comics. Okay. But, you know, it was... Um, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, um, Green Arrow, I believe, um, Green Lantern, Flash, and then they had a version of the Red Tornado, which is actually an interesting story in and of itself. The, what is his superpower? Well, the Red Tornado in the Silver Age was an android, okay. and he could form tornadoes and stuff. Oh. In the Golden Age, it was a joke character, oh. because Ma Hunkle, who used to take care of the house needed one time to be to appear to be a superhero so she put on oh. a sweatshirt used a towel for a cape and wore like a cleaning bucket on her head okay. and called herself the red tornado <laughs> it's one so, of those silly things but right. so the justice society was golden age and then when they reinvented the silver age they couldn't okay. have a justice society anymore right. so they had the justice league and that's brave and the bold 28 one of my uh Prize DC possessions. Of course, nobody can see that I'm holding this up. Right. But I have a copy of Brave and the Bold 28. It has no cover. It's in uh, lousy condition, but it is a copy of Brave and the Bold 1928, or number 28, which I have. Which is Which from is what the year? first Justice League. Oh. Um, I'd have to look 56? at 56? Yeah. Like, like in the middle 50s? Yeah. Okay. I think it. 1960, yeah. actually. 1960. 1960. Itself. So, and that... so you can see the characters. Uh, the characters in the uh, Justice League were Is the it... Flash, Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Superman, Batman, and the Martian Manhunter, and they're fighting Starro. Oh, who, who's Starro? Starro was a villain that could. He was a starfish. Starro. He's an alien, and he could spawn off little starfish that would and fasten themselves <laughs> awesome. over the front of your head and take <laughs> over your mind and make you his minion. Okay. And Starro. so that was that was the first. Uh, First appearance of the Justice League. Of the Justice League, yeah. okay. And so, then Legion came yep. later, um, and the Legion of Superheroes was set in the future, the far future. Time travel. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, they just came up with a new um, a new series. They started it off in Adventure Comics. Right. Again, I think in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, may, I take that back. I think it was Action Comics. They started it in Action Comics, moved it to Adventure, and then when they added and then they... Um, Brought it in and to the merge the Superboy comic into it, so it was Superboy in the Legion of Superheroes. Okay, but it was set in the far future, and all the uh, all the characters were teenage, more or less. Oh, it was like a, oh, it was a, it was a teen fighting. Yeah, it was group. a teen team, and they were all from like the thirtieth thirtieth century. Century, yeah, or and also like that. all the all different planets. Okay, so you um, it was very um, 
You know, it was diverse. It's it very it diverse. diverse. I mean, yeah, Brandiac <laughs> Five. He's green. Oh, come you on. Know, all that kind of stuff. Sure. You know, so, racism was addressed, yeah. no doubt. A little bit, not so much, really. Not so much. They, not so much. Not as much as you think. Later on, yeah, of course, but right. not back then. So back then there was okay. So those are the three main teams that are happening, yeah. right? And then, um, yeah, what was was in in that early stuff when you first started reading it? Were there social stuff before the Green Arrow? Were they really addressing not anything? so much? You they know, were just not, fighting not bad that, guys. Yeah, not so much that I remember. I mean, Batman, as I was starting to read it again in 1971, that was Denny O'Neill's stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was a little darker. I mean, that was Rachel Ghoul. You know, that was oh. the, the first time that he came in as a Batman villain. And, you know, it was Dark Knight. You know, it was kind of darker. Um, great stories. Superman, on the other hand, was really light. Right. At the, at the time, that was Kurt Swan writing all that stuff. And that was, you know, silly, you know, red kryptonite, green kryptonite, blue kryptonite, <laughs> white kryptonite. Uh oh, what's you know? blue kryptonite? I don't what remember does that which one him? blue do. Oh, right, blue right. Did. You know, green kryptonite, of course, poisons him. Red kryptonite can take away his powers permanently. Okay. They had all of this spectrum. They had uh, one version of it, which I think may have even been white, that would like take and give powers to other people that happened to be standing nearby Superman. Right on. Which was mostly Jimmy Olsen. Right. <laughs> You know, so Jimmy Olsen went through all of these things. Did Jimmy Olsen get to have Superman's powers for a while? Well, he had various different powers. Okay. You know, and, you know, it was it was weird stuff. Did he use his powers for good? Was oh, Jimmy Olsen always oh, a good kid? Come on, he's Jimmy Olsen. He's a good kid, yeah. right? Is Jimmy Olsen in the new movie? Did you see the new movie I haven't yet? seen the new movie yet. Me neither. Going to see it this weekend, probably. That's right. Probably with Andy Ashcraft yeah. tomorrow Maybe. night. And, uh, yeah, I, I want to see it. Um but that Batman guy's involved, and so... Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've heard a lot of mixed reviews about the, the movie. I don't know it looks if, cool. I don't know if we want to get into it too much here, no. considering neither of us have seen it yet. We can but, make some sweeping statements you know, with no information. Exactly. <laughs> that you seems know, a lot. I think the best thing we can do is hope it was better than the last one, which really, in my opinion, wasn't very good at all. Parts of it were good, but yeah, yeah there was some trouble. But uh, I didn't... I, yeah. I my What I grew up was with the Christopher Reeve ones, right? Yep. And so... And they were... They were great. The first I, two were. Yeah. The, the After first, that, they start going down. Oh, there was some trouble. Yeah. Is a uh, was Richard Pryor in one of them? Yeah, I think that was the third one. That's third sort or of fourth? when. Yeah, that's sort of when they started to go downhill. Yeah, yeah. They it didn't make any sense. Well, they just weren't good movies. I mean, the first one, you watch that first movie, and even now it holds up. Yeah. You know, especially the first you know hour or so of it with. You know, Smallville, and then that those scenes where he saves the president on the airplane and yep. just sort of first makes his appearance, that's, that's still great. That's epic. It's, it's cheesy, but it's great. Right, but that, I mean, that's one of the things I've always liked about about Super Superman is that he's such a, he's kind of a Boy Scout, you know? Yeah. And he's just, oh, he's the bright, blue, big blue Boy Scout. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's his character. Yeah, and so and and so to make him more complex, I mean, I get it. I get why you'd want to do it yeah. if you had to write him, but um, I don't want you to do it. To part of me, but I want to keep him. I want to keep him kind of simple. Well, you know, he should. You know, he stands for you know truth and justice. And if you right. want to throw in the American way, you can. I don't think you. If need you're to. an idealist, yeah. But you know, the, it's, what the American it's, way means. Yeah, it's truth and justice. That's you know, he's he. You know, Batman. Batman is about vengeance. Batman is about revenge. Right. Um. You know, that's his character. You know, yeah. he, he is. And from the get go, yeah, that's from what the it get go. Is? Okay. And you know, because his parents were murdered in front of him, that's why he became Batman. Right. You know, he's about revenge. He's about you know vengeance. Superman's about hope. Yeah. And again, that's started from his character because I mean, you know, Joel Seeger and Jerry Schuster, they you know they they were sort of oppressed. People. I mean, they they were Jewish in a time where it wasn't great to be Jewish. Right. You know, growing up, <laughs> the greatest understatement ever. It wasn't great. Did you read Cavalier and Clay? No, I did not. Uh, I uh, I've heard it's really good. You know what I like is that uh, a Andy gave it to me, and he was like, "It's got a Pulitzer." You know, it's amazing. And I was like, "Okay." And so I start reading it, and I'm reading it, and I'm, it's very long. It's very mm -hmm. dense. It's very well written, but it's very dense. Mm -hmm. And I'm almost done with it. I was like, "What did you think of this part?" And he's like, "You know, I never read it." And I was like, well, I'm going to cut myself because I have been slogging through this damn thing because it's art, right? Because it's a beaut. It's like be reading Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Yeah. And when you're like, it was amazing. I was like, what did you think of that third chapter? Oh, I've never read it, but I understand it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like reading Dickens, you know. You've right. you got to read Dickens. Oh, I never read Dickens. I never read Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so they created Superman as, as a character of hope. Right. You know, he was he was the, the champion of the oppressed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the help people who can't help themselves. Right. You know, sort of. The anti-bully kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And, and, and again, anti, so to a certain degree, anti-establishment. 
sort of like what they did in the New 52 when they reintroduced that, is, you know, when they reintroduced Superman, he was sort of fighting against a couple of corporate overlords. Oh, was and, he? Yeah, at the very, in the very beginning of the New 52. Okay. So, um... What was, what, so the, like, the, the first arc, right? Yeah. Is that what it was? Yeah, well, the first arc, it was the first arc, I believe, in action, where when the New 52 started, they had, it was theoretically about five years after superheroes started showing up. Okay. And so in some books, we're starting to tell the stories then. Some books were starting to tell the stories from like five years before to establish what was different about the characters. Okay. And they did, one of the Supermans was current, and I think that was Superman. And one of them was set starting from sort of the beginning, and that was action. Okay. So, you know, well, Superman. Did they do an origin Superman, story again? Uh, well, it was the same origin. It always okay. was. Yep. Um, I think his father died in that one. So, uh, but, you know, he was wearing jeans and a pair of work boots and right. sort of a T-shirt and being Superman um, before no, before anybody knew who Superman was. And, oh, okay. And he was sort of righting wrongs. And some of the wrongs were done. It's very topical. Sure. Was, um, you know, corporations. uh Corporations were oppressing people, and he was helping the like people who were oppressed and, and, and whatever. Okay. Um, you know, people who were just poor, people who weren't getting a fair shake. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. So. Oh, I get it. All right. Yeah, the whole the when, when they did it, the the whole New Fifty Two thing, they were just that. Their idea was that they were going to take all of the big the big stories and just reboot them, right? Yeah. Well, it was most. It was theoretically, it was the whole universe was being rebooted. And there, when you talked about crisis being a marketing, I think this one really was. Okay. Is, you know, sales were going down and they were looking to do something different. And right. so, you know, one of the things that comic book companies think is like, well, when sales go down and we need to do something different, we'll just reboot the character and a whole bunch of people will start reading the comics because they're new characters. And it hardly ever works. <laughs> um, but they rebooted the DC universe and the stuff that wasn't doing particularly well like Superman at the time, restarted. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff that was doing really, really well, like Green Lantern, mm -hmm. just continued like there was barely a hiccup. Oh, okay. Because they were like, well, don't break it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and cause, so, because Green Lantern has always done well? Oh, well, no. Green Lantern's been up and down. It's just the last few years, you know, I guess about eight. And yeah. one of the reasons of that is Jeff Johns, um, who just recently stopped writing Green Lantern, Green Lantern number 20. Okay. Was his, uh, the latest version of Green Lantern number 20 was his latest one. He had been writing Green Lantern for about nine years. And Is that long? That's a long time. To write, to write one? A one, to write one character, one book. I mean, he'd been writing other books, writes right. a lot of them, but he'd been writing that one character in sort of almost a nine year story arc. Is it Jeff with a G? Yes. Okay, I've seen his name. Yeah. Okay. And you know, he created the spectrum of rings. You know, the black ring, the oh, well, right. yellow, 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 and the sapphire rings all had always existed, but red, orange, blue, indigo, black, white. He wrote all of that. Okay. So Green Lantern is um, the, it, it's essentially a space cop, right? Yeah, more or less. And um, the the lantern itself, the ring itself, creates things that you create out of. Your will? Yeah. Out of it was will drives it. Okay. So theoretically. You know, will according to the comics, you know, yeah. will is the power behind, you know, green. So if you can dream so it, if it you can, can happen. If you can if you can think about it and will it to happen, mm -hmm. pretty much it will happen. Okay. And you know, so you have to recharge your you have to recharge your ring at the power, at your personal power battery. And then there's the giant power battery on Oa, which is where the, the Green Lantern core is based. Okay. And uh, so you you're given you're given a, a like a lanterny looking yeah. thing that you put your ring into. Oh, you touch it, you know, towards you, the front, sort of like just like in the Green Lantern movie, he puts it to the front and it right. charges up and, and it says the right oath. Up. Okay. Oh, and then he just he just he sort of reboots his oath. Yeah. And says I'm in. Yeah. We'll we'll do it again. And then does he, how often does he have to reach? What's the battery life of? Well, uh, Twenty four hours. Oh, is it? Oh, he has to do it once a day. Yeah, once a day. Okay. All right, so sort of a cleric yeah. with the with the sun. You got to say your yeah. prayers. I don't know exactly how they explained it when you know what you've if, got aliens from other planets that go that spin around in more or less than twenty four hours. Right, but right. What whatever. Kind of, what's we'll, a day? We'll, we'll just sort of fuzz that one out and That's not pay fine. attention I'll, to that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. That's fine by me. And then, uh, so they always had a sapphire ring, though. To your yeah, knowledge, well, they they later on they introduced star sapphires, which were villains at the time, mm -hmm. and his uh, girlfriend Carol uh, Ferris. Okay. Um, became one of the star sapphires, so they fought. And then, of course, Sinestro uh, was uh, the what yellow. Was, 
Okay. You know, like, so how, do, he, how do you bring in a guy named Sinestro and think he's not going to go bad? Right. You don't name your kid Sinestro yeah. if you're going to name. And so Sinestro had a yellow ring? Yeah, he had yellow rings. And the, what does the yellow ring do? Fear. Oh, it creates an, yeah. or you can generate fear yeah. of some sort. And then what does the Sapphire one do? Sapphire, well, at, at the time, it, they were just bad guys. Now, later okay. on, when Jeff started to do it, um, Jeff John started to do it, Sapphire was love. Oh, okay. Both the positive and negative aspects. Oh, uh, sort of obsession. Yes. Okay. And then now, and, and then you said that there's a, I know yeah, that there, I, there was red, which is rage. Okay. Orange, which is, uh, avarice okay. or greed. Mm-hmm. Then there was blue, which is hope. Okay. Then there was the indigo, which were kind of weird. Yeah. They, they did a lot of different things. Black was, was death. Okay. And then white was life. Okay. So, so could you resurrect people with the white? Uh, no. Um, well, maybe. Okay. The, the black people would bring people back from death, but they were sort of like, you know, evil zombie versions of Necromancery themselves. Necromancery kind yeah. of stuff. Okay. So you had Blackest Night, which was the rise of the death. Okay. And then you had Brightest Day, which is when one of the other Earth Green Lanterns, Kyle Rayner, became mm-hmm. a White Lantern and oh. um, sort of helped defeat Oh, the Black Lanterns. Oh, he was the hero for the uh, yeah. against the Black Lanterns. Yeah. Okay, and so and Jeff Johns wrote both all of that arc. Yeah, it, well, there there was other books that were are going around that other guys were writing. Um, Green Lantern Corps, uh, Red Lanterns, um, Guardian, uh, New Guardians. There were several of them, but uh, Jeff was sort of one of the driving forces behind it. It's been right. It's been a great story arc. Oh, that's um, just a fantastic story arc. It sounds cool. I mean, it sounds like like especially if you can. If if you don't just make those things and not use them, yeah. right? I mean, to actually use them and create mm-hmm. those crossovers and those yeah. giant battles. Well, and try to get behind what would make somebody put on a red lantern or a, ye- or a red ring or a yellow yeah. ring. You know, he tried he tried to do a lot of that stuff. It was really cool. Okay. Oh, um, well, that's neat. They actually had a um uh you know, about a month and a half ago now uh, down in Hollywood, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund right had a thing where you could make a donation to the fund. And they had a little celebration of uh, Green Lantern number 20, Jeff John's last Green Lantern. Oh, okay. So, now, Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, people should know, is yes. the ACLU for comic books. Uh, right? Sort of, yeah. Okay. Um, comic Book Legal Defense Fund, you can find them on the web, clbdf.org. Right. I like um, it. Yeah, they are sort of a First Amendment rights group. Um, they've been around for 20-some years now. Um it's because people are suing the yeah. It's you know people stores or the well, it's stores or creators or sometimes even um, even uh, people who buy comics. You know, like they've had a big case recently where a guy was going into Canada with a whole bunch of Japanese manga okay. in there, and they arrested him for child pornography. And it was just manga. Yeah, it was just yeah. manga. Because and and manga yeah, can a, be little, anything. Yeah, it was a little bit on the racy end of manga, no well, doubt. Cause, well, because because ma- manga can be porny. Yeah. But it can also be super violent yeah. because the Japanese do the whole gamut, yeah. right? And they understand that comic books aren't necessarily for kids. Right. And I think that's where a lot of the a the lot disconnect. of the stuff comes from. Is uh, you know there are people out there who want to think well, comic books are just for kids and always have been. And then in some cases, it's some, you know, local district attorney or sheriff or something that wants to make a name for himself. And right. And the local comic book store is an easy place to, to pick on it, to fight against people right, who are selling smut Marvel. to our kids. Right, right. and yeah. they don't sue DC or Marvel. Yeah. They sue, like, some individual yeah. or some small business And owner. so the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund was formed by a number of people who were in the big companies, Dennis Kitchen being one of the biggest ones. Um, who did he work for? Uh, I think it was... Uh, uh, Fantagraphics or Last Gra- Gas Comics. It was a okay. publisher. Okay. He was a publisher. And um, they formed the comic. You, you can find it all online. But right. They, I'll, yeah. yeah. They can find, um, you know, they founded the fund to help out people like this. And, you know, mostly, you know, most of the times all they, they keep a First Amendment rights lawyer on retainer. Right. And it, when somebody would contact the fund, they would, um, you know, send them out. Just send them a letter. Well, yeah. no, they don't even send them out. Just have them write, you know, a letter. You know, if you're, uh, you know, I grew up in North Carolina. If you're, you know, a local small North Carolina town and you yeah. get a cease and desist from a gigantic long for, law, law firm in New York City, well, right. maybe this isn't the best way to make a name for myself. I'll go do something else. Right, right. Um, so it was but, it was a little preventative, too. But it's a worthwhile thing. And, um, you know, mostly it's driven by donations from companies, creators, and fans. Right. And you can join for, I think, as little as like about 20 bucks. And, right. And they put it towards uh, helping out uh, 
Yeah, I um, think it, I think it's people. Tw- I think yeah, I think there's like a twenty dollar level, yeah. fifty dollar level. Yeah, the, it goes up. I yeah. mean, up and up and up and They'll up. They'll take whatever you got. It yeah. turns out. It turns out. And, uh, and it turns out if you're like you know Neil Gaiman and you're willing to cut them some gigantic check, they're they're probably more than happy to take yeah, it. They will, and and they're also interested in you signing some stuff, and they can mm. auction it off. So well, I've bought a few things that way. Yeah, <laughs> it's bought a few things for my friends. <laughs> it's it is. Um, I like it because it's it's such a it. Because let's talk about that, the fact that the, the comic books, it doesn't seem like comic books were ever made for children well, until that 50, yeah. like that Silver Age business. Yeah, the, the comic books, when they first created, were mostly for children. It was mostly children buying them. Okay. And then what really changed is, you know, especially, you know, it was World War II and then again in Vietnam. And th- these were sort of two transformative periods because one of the things that soldiers could do to maintain some connection with home is they could get a Superman comic or a Batman comic, or in um, Vietnam they could get some of the Marvel comics, which were really relevant at the time, right. and it gave them some connection to home. And so here you had guys that were in their 20s. Yeah. And so they come back, they want to continue reading a comic book, right. as it turns out. And so and you know they're more interested in something that's a, a more interesting story than... Perhaps when you're seven, right. you know, you're seven, <laughs> Superman punches the guy through the building. And you're when, like six. You know, yes. when you're 27, you want to know why he punched the guy through the building, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, and yes. so, you know, so they wanted more complex stories. And so I think that drove the change. Right. And I think, and there are still plenty of comics for, I mean, for kids. You know, it's not as much as it used to be. Right. Because um, a lot of comics, you know, most of your mainstream comics have... Themes that you know they're probably okay for a teenager, but, but not you may for not want your kids. you may not want your seven or eight year old kid reading them. Right. I don't know, but my brothers used to read a lot of Archie's and yeah, Archie's still around. Archie and Richie Rich and yeah. and you know Archie's still around. DC has a whole line of kids comics which are okay. like a lot of the TV shows. You know they're they're made for a younger audience, but they don't exist within the DC. Uni- universe as right. a whole. So there's sort of um, kids' version of Superman, yeah. Batman, yeah. and stuff like that. And some of them are pretty good. Yeah. I've read a, c- a couple issues here and there. But, um, yeah, because they're, they, I mean, they're not bad. They're just yeah. a lot younger. That's all. Yeah. And they're done it on purpose. So, yeah. so when, when you go to look at comic books, be aware of that. Yeah. And know that they're not all for kids. Yeah. And, and they're they, not And they haven't to be. been for forever. Right. You know, they haven't been since the 60s. Okay. Again. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when they started doing better storylines. Right. You know, yeah, it's. <laughs> And the, and then you know and then there you know so the, and then there's the mainstream you know superhero comics and yeah you know that's they're, they're you know maybe not suitable for seven but for your teenagers and then it goes up right you know then you get you know real serious stuff like the one you were talking about where they're they're doing serious social commentary oh right like, so what what are the what are the great titles right now that are out right now well um, in DC for me. Um, Green Lantern has been great. I haven't read the transition after that Jeff the current Johns? after Jeff Johns and the other creative guys left. So I don't know. I don't know about that one. Um, but the Green Lantern books, I, we'll see how the transition does. I mean, yeah. it, it could be fine. Mm-hmm. I'm not prejudging just because the the guys left. Um, I've been really enjoying um, a lot of the Batman comics. Okay, um, those were really interesting. I tried Batman Incorporated. Yeah. Is he still incorporated? Well, um, there's still a Batman Incorporated comic, and yeah. Um, Grant Morrison's stuff, he's a great writer. Yeah. He is one of the, the smartest guys I've ever, uh, I actually got to meet him once when some friends. <laughs> That's friend, neat. Well, one of my friends, uh, got a connection or something and said, oh, I can give him a tour of JPL. Turns out most people like a tour of JPL. Yeah, yeah. And so I got invited along. Yep. And he is, he is incredibly smart, but I think sometimes he forgets that we don't understand everything that's going on in his head. So his, ah. his what translates to the paper can be a little dense and hard to penetrate. Okay. And okay. so, you know, sometimes so it's to, fantastic. Yep. And sometimes you sit there and you go, I've read this three times and it still doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, so that was Batman Incorporated. But the Batman comics overall, I think, have been pretty good. Some of the ancillary comics, which unfortunately DC has been canceling, have been actually pretty decent. What what have they canceled um, recently? Dial H. They're oh. they're canceling that one. Are they die? Yep. No, no, no. First of all, I read the first Dial H probably ten years ago. Yeah. That uh, oh, that, long, longer. Well, there was a Dial H ten years ago, but right. then there's one that goes all the way back to the seventies. Right. I'd been I had heard about the previous Dial yep. H, but I had never read that one. Yep. And uh, it's it's a dial where if you dial the word hero, yep. you turn into a hero. 
Yes. And the hero always changes. Yeah. And it's usually a very, um, it's a, it's an opportunity for a serious dick joke. Uh, it's an opportunity for like some <laughs> crazy sex joke or some silly cross dressing moment. I mean, there's always an opportunity to turn you into a bird or a tiny dove. Yeah. That's also a bird, Jackie. Anyway, mm-hmm. but what, I mean, the thing, it's like, it, it, it was very jokey. Yes. And, uh, but it was also super but it was, interesting. It was a way for, it was a way for them to play around with a completely new character that they could have around for maybe one or two issues and throw away. Right. And then come up with a new one. You know, right. so as a writer, I guess it must have been interesting. As yeah. an artist, you were probably going, you want me to draw what? Right. What, <laughs> what is this guy's power? Yeah. And it's, sometimes it's lame. Yeah. And they're just like, well, this guy has memorized everybody's social security number. That is not actually very <laughs> helpful. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, well, it could be. It could no, be used for that. Leads you. That leads into another topic, which was: is the Legion of Superheroes? Right. You had the Legion of Substitute Heroes, which were the ones that couldn't quite make the A team because their powers weren't good enough. Is it like Great Lakes Avengers? In something like that. Okay. So, so substitute you had, heroes. Yeah. You had like Color Boy, who all he could do was spray <laughs> colors out of his fingers, and you had Night Girl, who was super strong as long as it was dark. <laughs> um, and did you, you had see in the you, dark. Yes. Okay. And then you had Stone Boy. Who could turn himself into stone and Uh-oh. not move? Right. Um, and Polar Boy, which he could have been on the mean team, okay. but he could shoot cold out of his hands. Okay. And so you had the he legion was just of slumming. Yeah. You had the legion of substitute heroes. Who, yes. You know, like didn't quite make the cut. Right. Um, That's so hilarious. They, 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 that there they was made always those guys. A, yeah, and there was always a chance to tell some silly stories around them. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and and but so, they were they were kind of fun because you go. Oh, they couldn't make the team, and you identify with that because, hey, I couldn't make the Legion of Superheroes either. I don't have a good power, <laughs> but you know, I, maybe I could make that team and make a difference. So you identify with characters like that. It's funny. Is there a DC version of the Pet Avengers? Um, well, there was again in Legion of Superheroes. Okay, they had the Legion of Super Pets. Oh, did they? Because there was Crypto, the Super Dog. Right. There was Streaky, the Super Cat, who was uh, Supergirl's pet. <laughs> Because girls like cats, um, of course. <laughs> and then there was um, the uh, the super horse, okay. also super girls. And super. then you had Beppo the super monkey. You had Prody, who was this sort of little shape changing thing that was Chameleon Boy's pet. Okay. And I may be forgetting one. Right, and right. And so you had but little silly a... Legion of Super Pets stories Legion here and there. Legion of Super Pets. Those see that's I th- some of that stuff is just fun for them, and then you know fun mm-hmm. for me. So well, that's cool. Well, because I did like Animal Man. Mm-hmm. Did you read that one? Um, I read a lot. I read one of the original versions of Animal Man. Interestingly enough, Grant Morrison. Um, and it was kind of tough. Back, yeah, uh, well, from the um, not from, from, the, from the late nineties. Or... Oh, late nineties. Um, and uh, I haven't read the new one. I read the first couple issues of it. I read the you know, yeah. Me being me, I read the first couple issues of all the fifty two books. Wow. Um, but there were some of them I really didn't like because yeah, you know, I didn't like this version of the character. I didn't like what they were doing there. It right. just wasn't interesting. And unfortunately, Animal Man was one of those for me. Yeah, just you know, some people love it. it. Yeah, it wasn't for me. Yeah, I uh, th- there were parts of it that I thought were great, and we continue to read it, but it got s- it slowed down. Sometimes yeah. when you read the issue to issue comic books, I found you're like. Well, I can't even remember what happened last yeah. time, and nothing happened this you time. You know, it's one of the cases where my procrastination comes into play, yes. as, as in a positive way, is, you know, it's like, okay, I haven't read this book for six months. i got six issues there. I'll pick up and read six issues at one time. Oh, right. And, you know, so sometimes that that's something that I started doing a number of years ago, especially with limited series. You know, something that was only going to last four or six months, assuming it came out on time. Right. And so I just let them all pile up and read them at once. Have you ever done um, the graphic novels instead of? Have you ever thought about that no. instead of doing a pull list? Nah, no? you know it's it's me. I love it's more I, fun. you know I, I, yeah I love to have an individual comic in my hand. Okay, you know that's why I'm willing to go you know buy a copy of uh, you know so, Brave and the Bold twenty eight with no cover so I can have <laughs> you know. and you can look at it and go that's what that is. Did mm-hmm. you read it? Yeah, is it pretty good? Eh, it's a it's a it's a story that's suitable for you know 1960. It's kind of you know it's DC and... it's DC in the 60s. They okay. were kind of simplistic, but they're fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a... I I'd read the story of course in reprint version. You know, they DC used to have these books that um, you know like World's Finest would have uh, an original story. And then, you know, four or five reprint stories in there. And so I'd read some of those. And, okay. you know, I'd read, you know, the various things where they collect the origin stories of comics. So oh, I'd right. read the story a few times. Oh, fair enough. And now um, the only other thing that 
I got turned on to recently was the the reboot of Wonder Woman, the mm-hmm. fifty two boot. Um, yeah. So I've read the first graphic novel of that. Okay. I found it on sale. Yeah. Th- that started out really well. Again, that's one of the books I'm several months behind on. Okay. So I can't oh. talk about what's going on this month, but it was a really interesting sort of reboot of that. They they've rebooted that character a bunch of times over the years and. Because they want to, her to be cool. Yeah, and made her, made her more heroic, you know, uh, based it, you know, dug into the fact that she was Greek mythology and introduced more Greek mythology into the character. Okay. Um, and they've done that over the years. Again, That uh, I think that actually started um, in the 80s. Again, I think Marv, Marv Wolfman and uh, I think maybe even George Perez was doing the art back then. Okay. Um, that really sort of dug into that character more than it had been in a long time. Yeah. So so so, so there are previous incarnations of the Wonder Woman story that really nailed yeah. it. Well, yeah, I think there's some that were really good. Okay. You, you know, Wonder Woman goes all the way back again into the uh the 30s. Oh, right. Um I forget exactly when Sensation number 1, that's the first Wonder Woman. Okay. Uh, that may have been like 41 or 42. Cuz she's a lady, Sensation. Yeah, a few <laughs> years after um the Superman, the Superman and Batman, mm-hmm. but yeah, Wonder Woman goes all the way back to the Golden Age. Okay. Now, all of course, right. they always didn't do well by the character like in the Justice Society, of course, being the only woman, she was the secretary for the Justice Society. Holy shit. Yeah, no she kidding. was not. Oh, she wow. Was. She took minutes. Wow. At, she took minutes of the meetings, meetings and all that kind of stuff. Did she despite bring coffee? Be, despite being probably the second most powerful character in the group behind Superman. Now, what so, makes her so powerful? What is What are her... I mean, she's got that lasso of truth, but... Well, she, is... she was granted powers by the Greek gods. Okay. You know, strength of Hercules, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh. Oh, okay. And so, so what's with the plane? What's with uh, the airplane that's invisible? Oh, don't ask me to. Is, yeah, is that I can't new-ish? explain that. Well, that no, no, that was um or was that I, I think again that was like, you know, 50s or 60s or okay. something. Okay. Yeah. You know, cuz it it varies times she could fly and it, sometimes she couldn't fly as well as Superman. So and I don't know if I actually don't know if they introduced that just for the TV show or if it existed before that. How then. weird was that in that TV show when yeah. she would be sitting in something and you're like, mm, see, then they could still see her." Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and who? I mean, if you could fly, who would fly reclined? Yes, I mean it's sort of like those recumbent bikes. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why are you biking while well, you're also <laughs> sitting back and uh, getting somewhere? I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> I but. don't mean to boss anybody's recumbent bike love, but uh, <laughs> so okay. So, so your favorite characters currently are Green Lantern. Um, well, Green Lantern has been a great character. Um, Batman's always. There's only been a few times in you know since I've been reading comics. Where I couldn't really read Batman. Always oh. loved Batman. Now what? Now what? See, because with me, with Batman, I'm scared of Batman. That's well, that's been always. Batman is scary. Batman's supposed to be scary, right? But that's okay. I mean, he's he's the he's uh, got it under he's control. The char- he, well, it very you know, more or less. <laughs> but he's the kind of character you know you can express your dark side through Batman. Okay. You know, Batman. You know, Batman goes out and he beats up the bad guy. Right. You know, guys kicking you around on the playground. It's like, man, I'd love to go Batman on his butt. Right. You know, so that, that that's sort of where I think that's sort of where that fantasy. Well, sure, makes that's sense. what draws you to Batman. Yeah. And and you know, he's he's. A human, you know, he he's a guy who trained all this stuff, learned oh, right, all this right. stuff, makes his make, you know, he has like, gadgets like Jack, he has. like Jack Nicholson from the uh, one of the early the early Batman movies. Where does he get those wonderful toys? Oh, right, you right. know, he's has you know he's great toys. Yep. You know, so it's hard not to like Batman. Right. So okay, so I do like Batman, but it's uh, just because you feel like sometimes he's on a thread. Yeah. Where you're yeah. like, is Batman going to turn into a? And all of his villains are crazy. Yeah. I mean, not even. Yeah. I mean, it's not like Marvel. Let's talk about the villains of DC briefly. No. And what are, what 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 draws you? Because sometimes it's the villains that can send me. Like we're reading Batwoman right now. Yeah. And her sister is a nut. Is nuts. She is yeah. creepily. Eerily, spookily, not okay. Well, she's a Batman. You know, she's something associated with Batman. So, of course, she has to be crazy. But, you know, there's great villains in the DC universe. I mean, in Batman, you had Ra's al Ghul. Now, here was a guy who, you know, he, he, could re, re, he could become reborn when he died, but he was as smart as Batman. Okay. You know, that's like, you know, having Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty. You know, okay. it's like you can, you know, it's easy to beat guys who are dumber than you are. Right. But to beat a guy who's as smart as you are, you got to work at that. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons he was such an interesting villain. Right. Because so, he was as smart as Batman. But he, he can, uh, he cannot be killed. Is that what the, well, his he theme can is? be killed. And then they have this thing called a Lazarus pit where they drop his body into it and 
he's reborn out of it, and it Can only works for him. Can anyone be dropped in the Lazarus pit? Uh, it depends Maybe. on when you're reading the comics. Fair enough, fair enough. You know, All right. So changed over time. Who doesn't want to drop Bruce Wayne in and yeah. bring him back? I think yeah. they may have even done that once. Right. <laughs> but um, they've done a lot of things. But, um, you know, so Ra's al Ghul. And then um, they had, you know... Because uh, I didn't when, mind when Jack, him, because he seemed human. He yeah. seemed like he, he like he wanted to fix the reason he wanted to torch Gotham in the movie. In the movie, uh, the reason he wanted to get rid of Gotham was because that's what that's what his yeah. order does. They get yeah. rid of things that are unfixable. Yeah, and in the comics, you know, he wanted to sort of you know recreate the decadent Earth and recreate a simpler time, quote okay. unquote. Um, yeah. You yeah, know, that never that trick never works. That trick never you know, works. It, tur- it turns out it turns out if you're you know just a normal guy working a job, that doesn't work so well for you as right. it turns out. Right. So you know that's why he's a villain. Yes. But you at least understood where he was coming from. Yes. And then you know other great villains, of course. You know Lex Luthor has been reinvented all over the place. But right. again, in the '80s, I think that was one of the brilliant things DC did when they rebooted Superman in the '80s is they made Lex Luthor instead of. Uh, a, a genius who made machines that would try to go crush Superman and was kind of, you know, comical wearing like a purple suit. Right. Um, <laughs> they turned him into a corporate villain, ah. you know, and again, in the 80s and, and today, frankly, depending on how you look at things, right. a corporate villain, you know, that's a real bad guy. That's a genuinely bad guy. Yeah, that's, you, a, that's a guy you, you not know, using a guy his powers who, for a, good. Yeah, a guy who doesn't care anything about anybody underneath him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is willing to trash anybody to get what he wants. Right. Well, you know, that's a villain. Yes. And so when they made Lex Luthor that, I thought it was far more interesting because, you know, he's a villain, but he's legit. How do you stop a guy that has a legitimate place in society? Right. And you have, you know, Superman, who's the super powered vigilante and, and the normal human who is the, um, he's, has a legitimate place in society. That makes for, an interesting, but is a, a, but has great power, you know, monetary power, um, political influence power. That makes right. an interesting story. So that was one of the best things that, that DC did when they rebooted back in the 80s after Crisis. Okay. Because those two are great. Mm-hmm. Those those two, I mean, now that you speak of those two villains, those are great villains. Yeah. It's the Joker and the Scarecrow yeah. that yeah, creep well, me and out. And the Joker's a great villain, and the Joker should creep you out. He's supposed to be creepy. He's right. the, you know, he's the he's the thing that keeps you awake in the middle of the night, scared. Right. You know, that's the kind of villain the Joker is. Right. But those, because the thing is, is whenever I think of DC villains, I always think of the insane ones. I don't think of Lex Luthor, and mm-hmm. I don't think of Ra. What's his well, name? Ra's al Ghul. Ra's al Ghul. Well, now we know what you're afraid of. Now I know. <laughs> I'm well, afraid of the insane. <laughs> yeah, you're afraid of the insane ones. <laughs> right. Those ones are <laughs> – that's creep factor 12. I don't yeah. need that. That's off the Richter scale. Yeah. So, um, okay. So – And then one of the other great villains is um, one of the big deals in uh, the 70s was when Jack Kirby, who had created half of Marvel Comics, right. um, left Marvel and went to D.C., and started writing uh, what was called the Fourth World, which was the New God Saga. Um, and you had I did the villain. Not know that you had he did a, that. Yeah, you had Apocalypse, which was the the bad world in New Genesis, and Dark Side was the ultimate ruler of Apocalypse. Okay. And he's shown up as a Superman villain from time. He's shown up battling the whole Justice League. Um, he was one of the big villains in the Circle. That was the. Um, he's an alien DC. villain. Uh, yeah, he's more or less an alien. It's, his name's it's Apocalypse kind of, or no? Yeah, his name's Darkseid. Darkseid. Yeah. And Apocalypse was the planet he ruled. Oh, I got, but, I, you know. I got to post a picture of that guy. Yeah. Uh, what does he look like? Um, Darkseid? You know, he's is kind he of, a hood? he's a big guy, kind of rocky. Okay. Um, very severe. I mean, you know, a lot of the bad guys were. They yeah. They weren't supposed to be, you know, they, they weren't supposed to be pretty. They were bad guys. <laughs> right, right. Um. But he's shown up in a lot of the uh, the Superman animated series, and then the the Justice League animated series. He was one of the recurring villains there. There's there's those animated series that have come out recently. There was the Batman one that came out in the '90s, I think. Yeah. Right. That well, was, that was one of the first ones. His '80s actually. Cause was it? I remember watching it in college. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was, but it was the first one that was. Was it real square jawed? And yeah. and Mark yeah, yeah. Hamill was the Joker. Mark Hamill was the Joker. He okay. continued being the Joker for years. That's steady work if you can, right? It's good work. So, and But that was the sort of, it was darker, but yep. it was a kid's TV show. Yeah. And um, and how did they handle it? Because I've never seen it. Well, it's, it's you know, oh, you should watch those. Yeah. Um, I've got some of them. I'll loan them to you. They're okay. great. Oh, cool. Um, but um, they, uh, 
you know, they, they had it darker in tone, meaning color tone. Okay. But the stories themselves were, were, were frequently, were straightforward. Were, were frequently not as bad. I mean, the Joker was insane, mm-hmm. but he wasn't like, you know, DC New 52 comics insane. Where he's torturing people and, yeah. and he's, he you know, would always where, where, threaten where to torture he, people. Where he comes back by showing up in the middle of police headquarters, cutting the lights on and off and killing 15 or 20 cops. Right. Insane. <laughs> right. Um, in the animated, but, he did not yeah, do that. No, so okay. the animated people they they didn't kill people, but you know they uh, because but he always it was, threatened to kill. Yeah, people. It was sort of darker and kind of you know, it was before steampunk was a thing. Okay, but it kind of looked sort of steampunky because you had dirigibles flying around Gotham City and excellent you know all these gothic and neo gothic you know architecture and stuff. But so they 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 were um they they were dark in tone you know in color tone. But sort of lighter in story tone. Okay, so still okay for kids. To and some one extent. of one of the characters that um, one of the interesting things about that is they introduced a character in there who became a part of the DC Comics universe, which was the Joker's girlfriend slash sidekick Harley Quinn. Showed up in the animated TV show first. That she was first in that animated yep. TV because I've seen not her... the first time they've done that with Batman. By the way, oh really? Batgirl. Was show, was uh, created for the TV show in the sixties. Oh, and then right. introduced in the comics. My other bit of show and tell for you that yes. nobody else can see, which is <laughs> but, uh, I will Detective Number Three Fifty Nine, first appearance of Batgirl oh. in DC Comics. But she had been, of course, in the TV show for a while. And what year is this? Do you know? Oh, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Again, you know, it was a few. It was a couple. It was only a couple of years after the TV show, so late sixties. Right. Okay, okay, and it's uh, it's a cool looking comic. Yeah. Have you, is it? Are there two of them? Uh, I just that's the way I put them in bags. Oh right, no, no, I know that's how Andy yeah. puts them in bags, yeah. back to back, no boards, no boards, no boards. It it uh, it it doubles your storage space uh-huh. and it keeps them nice and, and stiff. When, you, and when you've got as many comics as I have, that's a uh, how many comics important. you got? Uh, hmm. Best guess is somewhere between twenty eight. 28 and 29,000. Did, didn't you like start scanning them? And, no, and... I don't scan them. I, I have a database program that I use to keep track of stuff. And is it complete to your knowledge? The database program? Yeah. Largely so. Okay. It's called Comic Base for anybody that's interested. It's not cheap, but um, they have a lot of information in there. So it's a pretty good program. Okay. Yeah. It's but, uh, yeah, but that... yeah, I have a lot of comics. Yes. Yes. <laughs> We have a lot of comics. I said to Andy the other day, we were at the comic book store, and I said, we need to file comics. And he said, what do you want to do, file comics or our taxes? And I was like, oh, we should file our taxes. Mm-hmm. So, When that's a tough choice, you probably have a few too many comics that you haven't filed. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, what, what, what I, my, my job in the filing of, of comic books is I alphabetize them and I bag them. Mm. And, uh, and then I stack them. And then... When it's time to bo- to go to the boxes, go to the long boxes, right, and start filing them, uh, he has a list of what's in each box. And then he can just come and say, I need these items or these items. And then I can just start handing him. He's got you snookered because he's got you doing 75% of the work. I think, well, it's that's what I feel like, <laughs> <laughs> which is why I'm like, well, let's do this then. Let's Because we have tippy, you know, there's... Stacks and stacks of comic books that need to be put in. Yeah, that's one of the things. I, reasons I use the, the the database program is you can put custom fields in there and tell which box a comic is in. Okay, you know, doesn't yeah. always stay because if I was like, man, I want to read that, or man, I'm going to Comic Con, I won't get so and so to sign an issue with something, and I go right. dig it out of the the box it's in. It takes a while, or maybe even never, make it back into that box. <laughs> but that's what? the way it goes. So let's talk about Comic Con because you've been going since you I moved started. Here, right? I started going to Comic Con in '96. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, great, loved it. Um, what year the, did Comic Con start? Do you remember? Oh, uh, Comic Con started back in the '70s. I think. Okay, you know, it was a tiny little thing. It was like you know, fifteen guys who, uh, f- fifteen guys uh, and Jack Kirby, right? Because um, three or four of them knew Jack Kirby and got him to come down, right? Um, in San Diego, you know, Mark Evanier, Scott Shaw. I forget who the real gut powers were behind it, but they've been there since the beginning. Okay. Um, and uh, it was a couple of comic book groups in one in San Diego and one in L.A. And they sort of, you know, started putting on this con. Right. But, you know, to me in the last few years, it's grown to, you know, uh, and again, this may be because I'm 46, but, you know, <laughs> I don't enjoy it anymore because it's gotten so hard to do anything. Right. So I find some of the smaller cons to go to. 
Well, I've been to WonderCon in Anaheim last couple of years. That's been great. And what do you what do you want to do at a at a con? You know, when I in a, in a con, I'm you know I'm going to a con to do two or three things. You know, yeah. I'm going to wander around the dealer's room and especially an artist alley and see what people are selling. It's like, ooh, I'd love to have that. Right. You know, kind of thing. And, and it may and be a see... print. It may be a print that somebody's made, or it may be a comic book, maybe a toy. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And you know, I I really like going to a lot of the panels. Um, you know, one of the reasons I know as much as I do about the comics, I mean, I've read comics, I've read stuff about comics, but um, especially in the late 90s, um, they were having, you know, Golden Age panels and Silver Age panels where oh. they had some of these creators, many of whom are unfortunately no away. longer with us. Right. Yeah. Um, but they had them talking about what it was like to make comics in the 40s and the oh, 30s. Wow. And, you know, you learn a lot of really interesting stories yeah. with those things. Just so, to sit in on those yeah. stories is amazing. Yeah. So, who'd you, you get know, to, who'd you get to, did you get to see that Denny guy? At oh, all? Well, Denny O'Neill's, but Denny O'Neill's still around. He was oh. a publisher for DC. I actually met him at one of my first comic book conventions, which was Heroes Con in Charlotte when I was still in North Carolina. Right. And, uh, um, but, you know, met uh, Harry Lampert, the creator of The Flash, the Golden Age Flash. Wow. Mark Nodell, who created um, uh, the Green Lantern. Um, I've got, I, I've oh, met him. Cool. You know, about, about one of eight guys who used to be Bob Kane. You know, one of the interesting <laughs> things about Batman is it's like Batman created by Bob Kane. And it's arguable, it, it is arguable as to how much he ever did on Batman. You know, oh really? They, they, you know, it's said that he wrote the first ish appearance of Batman at Detective Twenty Seven, okay, and maybe drew a few panels, but most everything on Batman after that was done by other guys. Jerry Robinson, Bill Finger, who wrote uh, Batman. He's, you know, Bill Finger may not have created Batman, but he created the Joker. He created the Penguin. He created Robin. Wow. He created all of this stuff, and it was a, you know, tragically sort of under Bob Kane's name. Okay. Um, so it was only years and years and years later that these guys started getting some of the recognition. I was sitting in a panel one time and uh, at, down at Comic-Con, and the, the, the guy who was moderating the panel, his name's Mark Evanier, um, he said, okay, how many in this pe room, how many people in this room used to be Bob Kane? And like five guys raised their hand. Oh, oh man. So that guy, he farmed out some work is yeah. what I'm hearing. Yeah, pretty much. Holy but that's the way, that was one of the ways it was done back then. Right. You know, you had your studio, and your studio did work for you, and you went out and got more contracts or whatever. And it wasn't the fairest thing in the world. But, but everybody it, had a job, I that guess. Was, eh, it was sort of the way it was done. And, you know, tragically, it wasn't fair. Right. Um, it should have been more fair. But And so, like, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, they don't own a lot of the stuff at Marvel. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Well, very little of it's creator-owned. And okay. that's just the way it was. Right. That's and what, again, you know... Kevin Eastman was talking about how that yeah. that that that's that's why him and Laird yeah created Peter Teenage Laird, Mutant Ninja Turtles and the, that's why they t the, the fluke of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles it's the earlier episode of the Dork Force yeah. right where he talked about uh, so that's why they started the publishing company they thought that they could they were like oh we did this on purpose we created something we made a giant bag of money let's let's help creators. Yeah. Uh, create their own thing, not realizing that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a bit of a fluke. Yeah. And it just happened to strike the There's only the been a few. There's yeah. been a few over the years which have uh, managed to make it through. Like Cerebus, right? Yeah. Is Cerebus one? was one for a long time, although it never made nearly as much money as, uh, you know, the Ninja, Ninja Turtles, Turtles oh, or the, other things. Kevin Eastman was like, we will, people will buy that pr property, it'll lapse. Nobody will care about it. It'll come back to us. We will resell it. You want to do it on ice? Sure. Yeah. And uh, he's like, I will buy another house or I will put my kid through college. And it was it was a great episode of The Dork Forest, by mm -hmm. the way. This has been a great episode of The Dork Forest, uh, Lee Bennett. It has been an hour. And uh, so JPL is Jet Propulsion Labs, and that is the uh, uh, the, the people that you, in the end, work for. Well, in the end, I work for NASA. Right. And NASA, oh, right. NASA sends money to Caltech. Caltech sends money to JPL, and JPL sends money back to Caltech, and then somebody <laughs> writes me a check. Thank God someone, at the, at somewhere in that chain, you are paying your bills. <laughs> and uh, But this has been awesome. We'll, we'll have you back. We'll talk about SCA. We'll talk about sword fighting. We'll talk about uh, anything, quite honestly. We could probably talk another hour about DC Comics in a few months. Exactly. All right. Thanks for being on the show, man. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks for listening, folks. Take care. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh my god. Thank we you. why don't we just call that as the end of the show?